Hi everyone, thanks for joining this session. I would like to talk about how we can keep our web apps running at one time. And I want to start with a little story. Let's imagine you are about to go running. You probably start by taking on your sportswear and you put on your running shoes and you probably also start your timer. And then you're done, right? No, I don't think so. I think you only just begun at this point and it's not going to get any easier from now on. After all, you, you still have to run. However, I think this is how we often talk about web performance. We focus a lot on the page load and the time it takes to get up and running in the browser. But we don't often think about what happens afterwards. But thinking about runtime performance gets more and more important if your website is more like a web app and tends to be used for a long time. And that is the case for many apps these days, and even though it might not be obvious at first. Hi again, my name is Christoph Guttandin. I'm a freelancer and I have a company called Media Codings. And I'm usually uh, building apps like music players or video conferencing systems. And those apps uh, do indeed tend to run for a very long time. And therefore, I'm very keen to improve the runtime performance and stability as much as I can. As always, everything I, I present today is based on my own experience and yours may of course vary. So please feel free to reach out in case you have different opinions or additional ideas. I'm very much interested in hearing your thoughts. You can of course chat after this talk, but if you watch it sometime after the conference, you can find me at the usual places on the internet as Chris Gutandin. Okay, before we uh, talk about uh, tracking runtime performance issues, I think it's worth to stop for a moment to think about the fastest page out there. Uh, what is the upper limit in terms of runtime performance? Uh, as you may have already guessed, it is about blank. <laughs> it renders zero frames per second, uh, per second and because it never changes and it doesn't execute any JavaScript and it doesn't allocate any memory. It will also never throw a runtime error. Um, yeah, but sadly, anything we do to make our website um, more informative, more engaging, and more pleasant to use will bring us further away from the performance of about blank. And it is up to us to define how far away is okay. But it's good to keep in mind that no matter what we will do, our app will never match the performance of about blank. But it's definitely worth trying uh, to get as close as possible, and I hope this talk will give you some hints on how to do that. One thing uh, which you might already do, and I would strongly recommend doing, uh, even for sites which do only run for a very short time, is to track runtime errors. It's yeah close to impossible to catch any bug in your code with tests, and there will be things happening at runtime that you never thought of. And for those cases, tracking runtime errors is very useful. There are a lot of services out there which can help you with this, but uh, it almost always boils down to the code shown here. To track unhandled errors, you add an event listener to the window object, and this means whenever your code throws an error which doesn't get catched, the browser will let you know. Um, but one thing to, to watch out for is that in case you are using a framework or a library, it might be good um, to check if there is an internal uh, mechanism to track unhandled errors, which would prevent those errors from uh, being fired globally. And Angular and RxJS do, for example, have such a mechanism, which you would need to tap into as well to track all the errors. Um, yeah, another thing which, which often gets forgotten, especially uh, when doing error tracking manually, is to track rejections. And these are errors thrown by um, promises and they work a little different. Technically, it's, it's possible to add a catch handler to a rejected promise any time after it actually got rejected. So therefore, the browser never knows if an unhandled rejection may or may not get handled in the future. And as a result of that, the browser fires two types of events. Uh, one, when it detects a possibly unhandled rejection and another one in case it gets handled after the fact. This means uh, you would normally implement something uh, which waits for some time before reporting the rejections to make sure you don't report any false positives. 
And here in this example, we set up a timeout um, of 100 milliseconds for each possibly unhandled rejection. And we store the timeouts in a map, and the map is keyed by the promise which got rejected. And in case the rejection handle event fires with the same promise before the timeout expired, we cancel the timeout and never report the rejection as such. And since the implementation of this can get a little hairy, as you just saw, uh, I added a more sophisticated version of it to a library that I maintain. It's called Subscribable Things, and it provides wrappers around asynchronous browser APIs uh, to make them usable with reactive programming. And as you can see here, it provides a function called unhandled rejection, uh, which can be subscribed to. It takes an argument uh, to configure the duration of the cooling off period, and in this case, it's 100 milliseconds, as in the example we just saw before. And in my opinion, this is much better than re-implementing the code from before over and over again. But yeah, there's one thing that, that you definitely want to avoid when tracking errors, which is having runtime errors in your code, which is meant to track runtime errors. <laughs> if you track all the, the runtime errors and all the rejections, you will definitely, re uh, which, which I will definitely recommend doing, you will sooner or later realize that you can't fix them all. Many errors are caused by weird interactions with browser extensions that you never heard of before or only happen very, very randomly. And ignoring them can be useful to reduce the noise in your screen of errors. And most of the popular error tracking tools allow you to snooze or to ignore some errors to a certain extent. And it's definitely way better to manually choose which errors you ignore instead of ignoring them all by not tracking them in the first place. I just wanted to mention that leaving some of the errors unfixed shouldn't make you feel bad. Not everything which, which was wrong in the browser um, at runtime does end up throwing an error. There are other things which also harm your user's experience in case they happen. And the reporting observer is made for those uh, things and to, to collect notifications that would otherwise get locked in the console. And this is because if a browser logs messages on your user's uh, device, you would normally never see them. And typically, these messages tell you about the usage of deprecated APIs, uh, browser interventions, or violations of your content security policy. And unfortunately, the reporting observer is only available in Chrome, but there is at least an older way to track CSP violations by listening for the security policy violation event which works uh, across all major browsers. I also added a wrapper for this to subscribable things in case you want to use it reactively. Another observer that we can use is the performance observer. It provides a lot of useful metrics around the page load, but it currently gets extended to also provide runtime data. And in Firefox and Chrome, we can use it to get viable information uh, on events, and this um, will help us to identify those events that take more than the acceptable amount of time to process. And as shown in the example here, it can also be used to get information about any long task. And a long task is a task which takes longer than approximately 50 milliseconds. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, this is only available in Chrome yet. But it's definitely better to know about a long task in one browser than not knowing about any long task. And in the future, there might be also uh, an option to get notified about long frames, but that isn't available in any browser so far. And here is the same example uh, that we just saw using the wrapper provided by subscribable things. It follows the same pattern that we've seen before. It wraps the API in a single function call, which returns something that can be subscribed on. Since there isn't an official way to drag the frame rate, uh, the next best thing that we can do is determine the frame rate by uh, computing it ourselves. And the example code shown here does that by, by spinning up an endless request animation frame loop. It keeps on subtracting the previous time from the current time to determine the time it took to prepare the last frame. And this works, but it has a major drawback. <laughs> it keeps the browser busy. And in some cases, the only thing the browser might be doing is calculating the frame rate. And without this loop running, the browser would be able to set up uh, set the frame rate 
to zero as it does with about blank. And yeah, it could just uh, wait until the next event happened and uh, doesn't do anything. But running this code prevents that optimization. Therefore, I, I would strongly recommend only running this code sparingly and it's not a good idea to keep it running all the time. You could, for example, only run it while showing an animation and uh, use it to track the frame rate or to, to track if the frame rate drops or not. And once that critical animation is over, you stop the loop again. Um, another approach would be to tie it to the rendering mechanism of your front-end framework. And whenever it renders, you kick off this loop to compute the frame rate. You combine it with another loop that uh, uses request idle callback to monitor the idle time. And you keep both loops running until the frame rate stabilizes and the idle time exceeds a certain threshold. But yeah, it's complicated. And in any case, it would, it would also be necessary to track if the page is visible or not. Because otherwise the browser may throttle a uh, cause to request animation frame, even though your code is very well within the frame budget. So this totally screws the numbers. As you can see, <laughs> we somehow reached experimental territory and tracking the frame rate isn't impossible, but there is no easy solution yet which would work on any website. Uh, since a couple of weeks, Chrome also provides a way to track the memory consumption in production code, but this could potentially reveal sensitive information and therefore it doesn't work on every page. Uh, a page has to be cross origin isolated in order to use this API and uh, to achieve that you need to set two HTTP headers on the response of your top level HTML document. And this basically tells the browser to treat any request to a third party resource as a cross origin request, even though it's uh, for example just an embedded image and not a JavaScript file. In practice, this means anything that doesn't come from your own server needs to have a proper course headers, uh, which explicitly allow the request. And yeah, it absolutely doesn't hurt to enable this, even though you don't want to track the memory usage, but it is very difficult to enable this for pages, which include a lot of third party resources, which you may not necessarily control yourself. But if you are lucky and adding those headers doesn't break your page, you can track the memory as shown here. Uh, yeah, the API is asynchronous um, because the browser will wait for the next garbage collection to happen before it returns the result, which makes the result a bit more accurate. But yeah, still the numbers uh, are not that comparable because tracking memory is one thing, but using that information is another one. It, it highly depends on your web app, which numbers are acceptable and which do signal uh, that there is a problem. As a general rule of thumb, you may want to watch out for ever increasing memory. And if it only increases and never really goes down again, you might have an memory leak somewhere in your code. And in case that happens, you may find this article helpful. It shows a way to prevent the leak from ever coming back once it got fixed. But I would like to re-emphasize that um, Looking at the raw numbers of, of bytes isn't very helpful uh, because today's JavaScript engines are very smart and they might very well change the memory layout of your uh, application at runtime or from browser update to browser update, which means you will get slightly different numbers all the time and uh, you shouldn't be worried about that. Last but not least, there's a new proposal um, uh, going around right now which is called the JS Self Profiling API, and it would allow us to record traces like we uh, normally do in the DevTools directly in our user's browser. But this proposal is not implemented in any browser so far, and yeah, still in early stages. So far, we only talked about ways to, to track runtime performance issues or, and to see where we can help the browser to render our pages more efficiently or as fast as possible by not running into errors and doing less work. But sometimes you um, explicitly want the opposite to happen uh, because the browser sometimes is a bit too aggressive and throttles uh, or stops your page when, when you don't want it. And one way to prevent this is uh, this is a new API which is now available in, in Chrome, uh, which allows us to lock the screen. And this could be very helpful, especially on smartphones or laptops, which tend to lock the screen or to uh, dim the, the screen very, very uh, early. And if you have an application which needs to keep the screen awake 
a little longer, you can use this API uh, yeah, to make that happen. And again, there is also a way to do the same thing, which is uh, with subscribable things. In case you need to do regular recurring work at a fixed interval, and you need to keep um, doing that even though uh, your page is not visible, you also often run into problems because all modern browsers throttle the precision of events uh, for pages that are not visible anymore. And a common approach to avoid that is to run a timer on a worker which periodically uh, wakes up the main thread by sending messages. And over time, I needed that functionality often enough to, to extract it into a library. So over time, I came up with two libraries which can be used as a problem replacement for set timeout and set interval. And internally, they use either a web worker or an audio context to schedule the events. And these two usually don't get throttled by uh, when your tab is in, in the background. In conclusion, I would say that tracking runtime performance of a web app is still very complex, but yeah, absolutely worth the effort. But uh, this talk wasn't meant to say that page load optimizations aren't important as well. They definitely are, but especially if you're building an app which is meant to run for a very long time, optimizing and tracking runtime performance is important as well. Sadly, there isn't a one-size-fits-all style uh, metric or API, at least so far, that we could use to, to tell if a website has good runtime performance or not. It, it highly depends on your app and what it does and how people use it. But nevertheless, I think monitoring your runtime performance uh, would be a good first step to get a feeling for how your app is behaving in the wild and what parts of it could be improved. Thanks again uh, for, for watching this talk and for taking the time. As said in the beginning, I'm very much looking forward to your feedback and yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks again. Bye. Hey, it's Joe Eames with ng-conf. If you like that video, be sure to click subscribe either here or here, somewhere over here. And if you're looking for something more, here's another video for you to watch here or there or somewhere.